Good day, AVG News viewers. Olis Nube is my name. And we are continuing with our Friday talk show where we review Zimbabwe's political situation. And once again, we are joined by uh, our regular uh, guest, Dr. Zeb Maxwell Schumba. For those who don't know him that much, uh, he's a political analyst based in the United States of America. And he's also a former advisor to the MTC founding president, the late Mr. Morgan Richard Swangirai. He is also a founding member of the Movement for Democratic Change. Doc, welcome to the show. I'm fine. And the president of Zimfest. Yes, and the president of Zimfest. Well, someone asked me, they said, oh, <laughs> is he just an analyst? Yeah, yes, yeah. I'm still the president of Zimfest. Yes, thank sir. you. Uh, thank you, viewers for having me here. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, viewers, as we go ahead with this topic, I would like again to request or to invite you to subscribe to this channel, share this video and like it. Doc, uh, today we are discussing the elephant in the room, ZANU-PF. In short, what is ZANU-PF? Well, ZANU-PF is many things. ZANU-PF is the party which brought independence is ZANU-PF is the party which brought tears to the people. And we have to sort out through to see where ZANU-PF gets credit and where ZANU-PF needs to be put under the bus and where ZANU-PF needs to replay. So in a nutshell, ZANU-PF is a liberation party turned monster. Yes. That's our best I can describe it. Now, that obviously explains the bittersweet experiences of Zimbabweans under ZANU PF. Now, let's begin with the good that ZANU PF has done. Can you mention them? Yes. I think for, for people to understand the good and the the way ZANU PF changed and why it changed is just important to go through the history. I won't go into the histories which are well documented, but I want to start in 1980, also 1979. ZANU PF went to the Lancaster House to negotiate for a ceasefire uh, together with ZAPU. The Lancaster House agreement discussion started on September 10, 1979. And they ended on December 15, the same year, more than 90 days. And there were two things which uh, were at the table. One was between Zappo and Zan, and the other one was between Mugabe Zanu and Smith. Uh, Zapu, Zapu had the mentality that uh, going into Zimbabwe, we will need everyone. In transition, we need to ensure that we go in understanding that those who are there in power will contribute to the future of Zimbabwe meaning the wise, that we need to accommodate them. Uh, Joshua Nkomo was labeled as a traitor. Both Robert Mugabe wanted the whites to, to raise the white flag and he walks into another triumphant. So that disagreement is what caused the major split between Mugabe and Nkomo. And then the fundamentals of coming up with agreement got stuck on transition of power. Smith was demanding some accommodation for his people's minority and Mugabe was refusing. Those 90 days, you know, could have turned into a year uh, if these apartheid South African advisors of Smith told them, told him that, you know what, 
this Mugabe guy just wants power. He doesn't really care about the other fundamentals of the economy. He wants power. Give him power and retain the economy, economic levers. Because remember, when, when you're ruling, there is the economic power. It means those who have the means. And there is political power. So I said, no, he's just one political power. That's how it was said. And when we got independence, Smith and his people still had their levers of economy. And Mugabe raised the flag of independence as the president. And Zanu, remember, it was a Marxist party which believed in socialism. And you can see from get day one, they started giving freebies, cooking oil, cornmeal and everything, right? Because they, those are the things they have learned about socialism, uplifting the poor. But critical things were, were happening that those people who had gone into government, ministers and directors who coming from the bush, whenever they went to banks, they, were, they could not get loans. We want to buy a farm. And all of a sudden, it was a very clear. And by the way, I wanted to say, ZANU-PF had a, a leadership court. ZANU-PF had a leadership court, which forbade, which, uh, forbade leaders from accumulating wealth. And also, in, leaders had to declare their assets. So it, it downed on Zanupi of leaders eventually by 1985 that yes, they'd got an independence, but they were still economically in Rhodesia. The whites had set up new schools, like in Mutara, they set up a school called Crescent, Crescent just above the Christmas pass, very expensive. All schools, Peter House, Falcon, eh, Loma Gandhi, all these schools became white only and out of reach for the blacks. When you go to the agricultural show, there, there was a stand for the agriculture where they, they showcase their farm pro, uh, products, bull, cattle, what have you. Beer was three times the price. Food was four times the price to keep out the blacks. Cricket, rugby, all those became very sports for the rich. And that's where they met. In school, former group A schools like Prince Edwards, they, they coalesced around rugby, funded it, and things like soccer never got anything. So it downed on, on the Zanipi of leadership. And I remember very well, uh, Gumbo Morris, the late, saying publicly, look, we were one independence, but when we go to the banks, we had made laws. Our people come to us, looking up to us to help them facilitate this. But when you go into the bank, you're given a cup of tea and that's it, a goodbye. They could not get loans. And in 1985, they abandoned the leadership uh, court. And in 19, remember there was a policy of reconciliation from 1980. When they realized that they were being played, the whites were creating a Rhodesia within Zimbabwe, which was untouchable to the Zanu. That's when they changed. That's when they started taking a hard line against that. Uh, just, just before you go ahead, um, I, I've got a question. You said Zanu PF were Marxist, but uh, were they not Maoist? Yeah, those are, you know, Maoist, Marxist, they were, you know, when, when you read, you and me, when we read things and we say, oh, I like this, I like this. In practice, they were nothing. They were none of those. Okay. Those were just, uh, we're coming from China, in China, more East. So we believe what the Chinese are doing, what the Russians are saying, but there were none of these. What they believed, to be honest, was 
they were tired of colonialism. And so what they believed is that we need self-rule. That was the driver. In self-rule, is that's what you got. But with the self-rule, unfortunately, they were played in Lancaster House. Then they were given political power, but not economic power. So in 1985, these people who had drafted a leadership call, and when they abandoned it, they started on wealth accumulation screen. And that's where the grid started. Because now each one, I will visit you, you are the Minister of Agriculture. And they see all of a sudden your distractors and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, I don't have any. I want what he, he has. That's how it started. And then eventually it stood the war veterans. The war veterans had nothing. And they started doing demonstrations with the Wunji. They were impoverished. And they were pointing to the ministers. You have this, you have this, and we don't have this, but we're together in the bush. And under the weight of a revolt, Mugabe who gave the war veterans and, and budgeted $50,000 each, which tanked the economy. That's when the beginning of tanking of the economy, because the, the Zimbabwe dollar at that point one was one is to seven. In the following morning, it went one is to 25 and then stabilized a day later to one is to 14 and stayed there. Yes. Uh so now, because the question was, are there any positives that we get from them? Now, I wanted, I wanted to give this picture. Yes. This period between the Zimbabwe dollar tanks, what were the positives? They built schools. Remember, people, I have heard people say, oh, Smith was better. Smith was not better, no. Because with Smith, Zimbabwe had an education system of sub, sub A, sub B, which was grade one, grade two. And then standard one, standard two, standard three, four, four, five, and six, right? I want you to understand. M majority of Zimbabwean schools ended up at standard three. Let's count the years, sub A, sub B, standard one, standard two, standard three, grade five. Yes. Majority of Zimbabwean schools ended at grade five. And then very few schools had standard four, standard five, standard five. And standard, so standard six, no, standard five and six was like the A levels. And the, I, I, you, can, you can investigate how many standard five, standard six schools were in multiple Smith was producing semi-illiterate citizens. It was designed. All our elders, these people we laugh at that they can speak English, it was not their fault. It was that designed education that you end at grade five and you go to work. You get what was called Shitikinyani. Shitikinyani was a, a, a minor ID, a, an ID for a minor. Yeah. And you go work as a minor. And, and now you have all these semi-illiterate citizens who are classified as subhuman, who are classified as second, second class citizens. When you get a job, you are allocated the room along with 15 others in one room, the Matapi flat, the Magaba flat, those rooms, those rooms were allocated 15 people per room. And, and you cannot say Smith was there. So bringing independence is a, a positive. And we should not mix ZANPF's problems or ZAPU's problems, that is ZAPU's demising with their work to bring independence. We got independence. Blacks were not allowed to vote. 
Right now we complain all oh, there's bridging, but at least we vote. Smith legislated that blacks should not vote. Legislated that blacks were second class citizens who should not share the same toilets with whites, who should not walk in offensive streets, who should not go into some places. Yes. Then PF took that away. That's a positive. And when it was independent, started building schools. That was a positive. Then on land, on land, because, because the Lancaster House conference is the willing buyer, willing seller. That's remember I was telling you, Smith was advised that given the political power and the return of the economy. So on land, they agreed that those who own the land will sell on a willing buyer, willing seller basis. But mostly they will be encouraged to sell the relic land, land they were not using. So Mukabe's hands were tight. He could not go towards federal land because all the whites released land which was not fatal, which were resettled settled to people during the first phases of independence. When people were resettled, uh, they used to call Mina or you know, I don't know how I can best <laughs> translate it in English, but it, it show it, it's kind of like the big farms, right? The big farms, people are coming from communal areas where they were pushed to, which was another act of colonialism and Mugabe took it away. So Mugabe, for example, me, I will tell you my personal story. Uh, when Mugabe went to Cuba and visited the island of youth, where there were 42 nations sending their students to be educated for free. And Mugabe was taken to the school for the Namibians, which was a high school. And Fidel Castro told Mugabe and said, you, you can bring also your kids and they can set up a school for them. And Mugabe said, no, I don't have a need for secondary school education, but I have a need for teachers. And immediately a program was uh, put in place to educate science teachers. And we went, as the, I went as the second batch of science teachers to Cuba. We're educated for free. We came back to Zimbabwe, unfortunately, Mugabe he turned into a beast. And most of those teachers who benefited from that left. Initially, they were taken by Namibia and the United Kingdom came, took them out, and now Australia took them. <laughs> so we are all over now. Yes. But um, those are some of the positives, which, you know, living in an independent Zimbabwe, I lived in both eras as a young boy, very, very young. Where, when you saw when you saw a white man driving a car, you ran into the bush. But they could stop and beat you up for looking at their car. We, we used to run young, five, six, seven, and I have those memories. Imagine how many memories do you have as a five-year-old? I do have them because they were traumatic. Growing up in Rhodesia was traumatic as a young child. Mugabe and Zanu took that up. We should not, we should not downplay that. It's not Mugabe alone in Zapu. Because those two parties sacrificed. We cannot talk of Zanu without talking about Zapu. Yes. And then talk um, in the interest of time. Now we're moving to the negatives. I think we all know the negatives under Zanu PF, but. Yeah. Uh, I would like to pick a few and try uh, and dissect them with you. The first yeah. one, obviously, which happened between 1981 and 1987, and one which will never go away in the history of Zimbabwe, is the Kukura Wundi massacres. What do you think led to this? Obviously, there is power at play, but what led to the butchering of civilians, for example? Yeah. 
from from what I've learned, there were several factors which led to that, which are downplayed. Number one, there was going going into elections, there were suspicions between Zap and Zan. The disagreement started in Zambia, which made Zanu move to Mozambique. So you are bringing two parties with potential of arms. You, you, you always sleep with one eye open. And if someone does something, you misinterpret it as, oh, they want to take me out. So the suspicions between the two groups played a, a role. They went into camps like in Stumiza, in Blau Island. Uh, they were together in camps and they started shooting each other. There was no politics. It was the suspicions between the people who were on the ground with us. And then there were some forces which did not want Mugabe. But remember Mugabe came as a Marxist. Yes, yes. So they, they, were, they were showing favors to one side. The British were favoring Como, and Mugabe took it as British are preparing Como to have a coup. So once you get into the talk of a coup, you talk of a war, right? Preparing for war. So everything got overblown and overreacted. And Zanus culture, because you talked about civilians. Yes. Zanu did not start killing civilians in 1981. During the war, Zanu was killing civilians because the Zimbabweans have not changed the way they were back then. Zimbabweans do not want to focus on bigger things. Zanu had to force those people in the rural area to support the war. And there were people who were selling out. And those people were being killed in front of the villages. Remember Rukare, Gumbo, and Kof others were <laughs> put in a pit. Yes. They were, there was a battle of something, something who were executed. Zanu PF has been ruthless. Why? Because of its roots. The people who funded the war, you can go back to their history, Russia and China, how they deal with their citizens. Is there similarity or no similarity? So it's the nature of Zan that if up to date they have not changed, they're treating citizens the same way they treated citizens. In the only thing is. 1980, 1987, they did it in, in mass. Yes. And then the other question is, according to your own assessment, is ZANU-PF a tribal party? Yes, it is. And that's one of the reasons why Bukura only happened. Because it was that tribe. You see? Because if Zanpiof was not a tribal party, they would not, they would have shed a tear to the mother and daughter who are being killed when they're not armed. Yes. Uh, and, I, yes, go ahead. Uh, and do you think the current Zanupiev has any remorse in as far as Kukura Wundi and the ultimate uh, damage that was done by the operation uh, consent? The people in Zanu have no soul. They have no soul. Look at us, we are in the diaspora in South Africa, I'm in the USA. Yes. yes, it's easy. They will take you, they will take you, put you in jail and rot. Have you seen how people are treated in prison? Yes, 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 yes. I've, I've and have you seen the mansions they built? The mansion they built? There, there was a hurricane. There was a hurricane in, in Manikaland, which wiped out villages. In the donations, the ministers were given the donations, took those donations for themselves. Yeah, yeah. Therefore, so. And then 
Well, There's no I remorse. Think. Don't expect remorse from Zanipir. Expect remorse from a new leadership, which is going to take out Zanipir out and come to the people and say, we need to address these issues because we cannot move forward without addressing those issues. And then let's compare ZANU-PF under Robert Mukabe and ZANU-PF under Emerson Nangabo. Is there any change there? Do you see any change in terms of ideology or in terms of doing things? Okay, here's the thing. Time changes everything, right? Because life is dynamic. Yes. But, but Mugabe was bound to be where he is with time. So the, the difference here is time. No, no change. Zan is Zan. Any leader from Zan will be able what like it is doing. Because Zan is an institution with a culture, with norms which are acceptable. You hear language like Unofira Mahara, you die for nothing. Yeah. That's heavy to talk about death of an innocent person. But to them it's normal. So I said it before the coup, the eve of the coup, the day after the coup, that it's ZANIPF 2.0. You are not changing anything. People did not listen to me. Like they will not listen to me now when I'm telling them that you have to pay attention to the people you want to put forward as your leaders. People got into the street and said it's a new dispensation. What has changed? The CIOs are there. Our party has survived abductions. CCC is not surviving abductions. They still, people are still disappearing. In terms of economic performance, Zimbabwe is even worse off. To the extent that people think Smith, a man who treated as a subhuman was better. Yes. Uh, and then talk, talking about the good days, I remember I interviewed you. Yeah. I think it was two or three times yeah. for Christian Science Monitor and World Politics Review. You said these things that people may be overjoyed and everything because they are desperate to see the back of Mukabe, but nothing is going to change. Yeah. We are here now, nothing has changed. And then you said something about a triage. Can you explain yeah. that for the benefit of our viewers? The triage was, it's something which uh, countries like North Korea perfected. But you, you, you get people into the military who are loyal to you. And then you get people into political positions who are loyal to you. And then you build your family as a dynasty. Mugabe had built that tri triage that people in the CIO, in the police, in the military were pulled from the war, the Zanla war veterans section. Only those who were loyal to Mugabe, who swore loyalty to Mugabe, who could go in public and say, no one can be president who did not go to war and no one can remove Mugabe. And I think you remember those statements from the brigadiers, right? And then in, in politics, you had people say Mugabe is Jesus. You see all those people. So when the people in politics then connive with the people in institutions like Registrar General and the military is there to ensure that it goes against the will of the people and your family becomes bigger than life. That grace will be talked about in the same vein as Mugabe has been talked about. You see, Munuwese Kunamai, you remember that? Yes. That's building of a dynasty. Mugabe is gone, which was not a citizen's effort. It was from within, right? People who understood that triage, a neutralized people of the military, neutralized and some began to defect, a neutralized people in the politics. And now we have the same triage with ED. Yeah. But now something is happening. 
I want you to know, in the military, uh, ED has done something Mugabe did not do. And he arrested, he arrested war veterans. No, there is division in the war veterans. War veterans split, you know, they are fighting. And, and remember, there are war veterans still in the army, war veterans outside the army. It, it's difficult to keep the unity. Yes. Um, in the interest of- And in I... politics, and in politics also, there are some ZANU PF elements like Jonathan Moore and the likes outside ZANU, and they are with him. So it's, he's battling to build that triage, but with difficulty. Yes, uh, we, we are left with five minutes. Uh, we'll continue this discussion again next week. But before uh, I let you go, you are saying something that is very interesting, that ED is trying to build his dynasty, but because of the centrifugal forces within ZANU-PF is somehow failing. What do you see of him? Do you think that he's going to hold on until uh, constitutionally goes out? Do you foresee him changing the constitution to stay on? Do you foresee him going the same way as Robert Mugabe did? Just in short. Yeah, in short, these people remember ED without Chiwenga was powerless. So what we are fighting is a dynasty of ED and Chiwenga. Chiwenga would want to be president after ED. They, those things were agreed long time ago. If you, if you go, I come in. And when Chiwenga goes, someone else will come in, but all these people will protect their interests. You remember ED protected Mugabe's interests? Yes. Everything. Yeah, so. Interest, yes. Same applies, Chiwenga will protect ED's interests. And our battle, before I finish, our battle is to understand this monster, which I said it's a monster, which knows how to stay in power against the people's wishes, who strategically win when they are not liked, who know they want to win and they will win even if people don't hate them, who know that the people hate them, but they want to stay in power. If we fail to understand that, we will never plan to remove them. Yes. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, my next question is on E.D. and Chiwenga. We are hearing rumors, we are reading, I hope you, uh, you've also seen some of them. Since a few months after the coup, we've been told that the two are no longer in talking terms, the two are plotting against one another. Do you think there is any substance to that? No, no, no. <laughs> so social media, you know, people want to be hyped because they are desperate for change. Those things, stop people from planning for change. People need to plan from a position that ED and Chiwenga are in the same corner and they are powerful and they will need extra effort to remove them. The moment you start thinking, oh, they do their guy, the that's the moment you lose. Yeah. There is no such thing. They know when ED is gone, Chiwenga, Chiwenga will come in. That's their plan. And that's the plan the people have to fight against because these people are clueless and these people are greedy and they're corrupt. And, and, and then lastly, some of the generals that were involved in the coup are no longer there. Some of them died in mysterious circumstances. We are talking here about parents Shiri, we are talking about Spusiso, we are talking about Nikaya Ramba. One of them uh, died just uh, um, recently. Do you think these were natural deaths or something fishy happened? You know, all I can say in Zanpia, we cannot discount anything. Any, anything is possible in Zanpia because they murder each other. And also their love styles, some of these guys have got 20 or 25 concubines, wives and 
Zimbabwe has got HIV. So between Zanipia killing its own and HIV helping them to put their own, you can't discount anything. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Doc. I hope we're going to have uh, maybe two or three more episodes to discuss ZANU-PF because, as you've said, this is a monster that we need to fully understand before we can talk about uh, trying to get them out of power. Thank you very much, Doc. Our time has run out. We'll meet you again next week. Thank you. They have too much money, these guys, so <laughs> they can have a 40-40 girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you.